Thank you guys for coming out on a Friday night. Appreciate it very much so that we can welcome Phil Metris. Um, and first, before um, we get started, I just wanted to um, tell you guys about a couple other things that are going to be coming up. This is the first um, of the literary series programs. Um, the second one will be November 1st, where we're going to have poet Jericho Brown at the Prince Frederick campus. And uh, everyone here tonight is going to also come to that. You won't want to miss it. Um, do I have any creative writers in here? Photographers? Artists? Everyone should raise their hands. <laughs> um, so um, the Connections Literary Magazine um, your opportunity to become published students, community members. Um, the deadline for that is October 24th, so it's coming up. But if you have poems, short stories, photographs, um, if you create art, we can try and get an image of that. Um, it's, an ab it's an absolutely wonderful event that will take place December 6th and to finish the semester where um, accepted submissions, the students come and we do a reading and it's a beautiful night of everyone coming together and showing how talented we all are. So that's housekeeping stuff. We had a nice fall day today, right? So um, I want to start by thanking you again for coming out to welcome Phil Mattress and um, just to give a little bit, I had someone say, are there any pamphlets or anything to kind of let us know what the program's about? So um, I think I have a, a pretty good way of letting you guys know what that is without handing you a booklet. Um, and some of you might get some of these references. Bear with me if you don't. So when I was a kid, and believe it or not, it really wasn't that long ago, um, I watched Saturday morning cartoons. I watched the Jetsons and the Flintstones. Anyone heard of those? Um, and as far as movies, it was VHS and my father taking me to Blair's video shop to rent them. Do you guys remember Blair's? Some of you, yeah. Um, and I watched movies like The Gremlins and Back to the Future, right? Um, and for music, music was adjusting the radio dial to kill the awful static. Does anybody remember that? Fast forward 30 something years. The leaves believe such letting go is love. Such love is faith. Such faith is grace. Such grace is God. I agree with the leaves. My daughter is 14, unconsciously calling to herself information from Twitter to Instagram to Snapchat. You also know what these things are, right? She has little to no control over these things because she wasn't brought up when I was, with fewer choices, less distraction, bombarding her from the time she wakes up in the morning to the time she goes to bed at night with no one telling her when she's bored to take a walk around the block. I made it up here on this bridge between starshine and clay, my one hand holding tight to my other hand. Come celebrate with me that every day something has tried to kill me and has failed. These are the moments Phil Metris is here to remind us of What's trying to kill us every day may well be the onslaught of information overload, that among other urgent concerns, Metris's work underscores the sad state of our day-to-day -day lives, that way too much information is coming at us. He reminds us that the poetry all around us, the leaves, the starshine Lucille Clifton writes of, if acknowledged, affirmed, celebrated, will slow us down take us off the path of constant distraction, strengthen our connection to ourselves and those around us, reaffirm our shared humanity, and the best thing of all, stop a tank. Thank you, and welcome Phil Metris. Thank you so much, uh, Rachel, for that kind introduction and for the invitation to come share some words with you tonight. 
I'd be curious to know how many of you have ever been, how many, for how many of you is this your first poetry reading, whatever that means? Okay, okay. So you're probably wondering, what did I get myself into? Um, I hope you do remember at some point in your life that someone read you a story. Maybe it was at a library or, or you know, in kindergarten or before bedtime. Um, in some respects, most readings have some of that, and, and I hope that they have a similar effect, which is to make you think, to invite you to envision a world that you might know or might not know, and to imagine yourself in that space for just the space of a, a little bit of time together. And in the process of retreating from your lived life, be able to come back to your life with a new sense of purpose or a sense of mystery about what it means to be human. Because although we are obviously different, we share so much in common. And for me, literature has always been a way to remind myself of that. Um, I think I started writing because I felt probably what you feel on a daily basis, a sense of the seethe of your own emotions, a sense of confusion about what it what I'm supposed to be doing with my life, a sense of awe at the beauty of the universe, a sense of anger at the injustice of it, a sense of curiosity about what I'm meant to be doing and where I'm, what my purpose was supposed to be. Those questions were not answered by literature, but they were uh, provided with various ways of, of, of thinking about it, of imagining it. Every time you, I read a story, I thought, I could be this person. You know, I could be this person. What would it be like to be this person? And how can I leave this story with a sense about what it would mean to, to be myself, actually? Um, so Neil and I have been talking a lot today about Ireland, or Ireland, as the Irish pronounce it. Um, we, have, we share a poet that we love named W.B. Yeats. And I'd like to start by reciting one of his poems, which to me is a kind of talismanic poem, a poem of refuge. Uh, it's about a place that he saw when he was young. Now, if you remember when you were young, there may have been a place that was magical to you. It may have been the woods across the street, or it may have been a little island in the, in the middle of a lake. It may have been uh, who knows what. But for, for Yeats, it was a, an island in the middle of a lake. Um, and it's called Inishfree. This is called the Lake Isle of Inishfree. I will arise and go now, and go to Inish free, and a small cabin build there of clay and wattles made. Nine bean rows will I have there, a hive for the honey bee, and live alone in the bee loud glade. And I shall have some peace there, for peace comes dropping slow, dropping from the veils of morning to where the cricket sings. There Midnight's all a glimmer, and noon a purple glow, and evening full of the linnet's wings. I will arise and go, for always night and day, I hear lake water lapping with low sounds by the shore. While I stand on the roadway, or on the pavement gray, I hear it in the deep heart's core. I think that that poem sort of expresses something that we all want, uh, almost on a daily basis. And we often try to find it in our little cells, but we don't necessarily find it there. And that is to find a place of seclusion, a place to retreat from our life. Um, and I shall have some peace there, right? Which is something that the poem is wanting. And what I love about that poem is it's in the future tense. So it's this thing that he wants to do, that he imagines will do at some point, but perhaps because it's in the future tense, never gets to do actually. So he fantasizes about it. And he fantasizes about it while I stand on the roadway or on the pavement gray. He's in the modern world, the built world, where we find ourselves. And that includes, again, the little cells where we, where we escape to or try to find some distraction, um, and really wants to go back to that place where he first felt the magic 
of his own fantasy. And I hope that you find those places. For me, poetry has been a way of returning to those woods, those magical islands of, of childhood, really, and to, to be in touch with that. There's a book out there for sale. It's, it's called The Sound of Listening Poems as Poetry as Refuge and Resistance. And for me, I think it, poetry began as a way for me to, to make sense of the crazy chaos of what it meant to be me. Who, who am I, precisely? Um, but also, as I grew older, I saw it not simply as a refuge or a space, but also as a kind of a shield or um, a way that I could sort of enter into the fray of what it means to be a person, a citizen, in a country where we sometimes disagree with each other in radical ways, um, and to sort of find my own truth and my own voice to empower myself to say things maybe that I couldn't say in any other way but through language. If you are a person who's trying to find a way to do that, may I suggest writing some poems? <laughs> may I suggest taking pen to paper or you know, fingers to a keyboard to find that space for yourself? For the writers in the room, you already know. I don't need to preach to you. You will find something there that you will not get anywhere else. You will find something there that you will not get anywhere else in the world. Um, and that is not simply you articulating some truth about what it means to be you, but that language will speak through you a truth that you did not know about yourself. And that is the beauty and the excitement of being an artist and a writer, is not simply you sharing what you think your truth is already, but to discover what it is on the page and then to see yourself anew in that process. And every time I write a poem, I feel like the poem is going to teach me something about what it means to be alive, what it means to be me. So if there's only one thing that you get out of this, it's this guy told me, maybe I should write something down the next time I have a thought that I have no other way of articulating. Instead of tweeting it out, just write it down for yourself and build something around it. I had the chance to see, of course, you know, being a fan of a writer, going to the old stomping grounds where he lived to go visit this island, or at least see the island from the shore, this Inish Free. And um, it's, um, it's nothing special. The specialness was in him, really. The specialness was in him. And you all have that inside of you. Sometimes you've you know, pushed it down real hard because life has taught you that you can't listen to the music in your own heart, in your own imagination. But I'm just telling you, find it again because it's there. Find it again. So that's the inspirational part of this talk. It's over. We can move on to something. I'm just kidding. Uh, move on to something else. Um, I wanted to share with you some poems from a new collection I have, which is coming out next year. It's called Shrapnel Maps. And it's essentially a book-length series of poems meditating on the various voices of people in Israel and Palestine. Have everybody heard of this? Has everybody heard of this place, Israel or Palestine? Um, as you know, for those of you who do know, it's it's a very contested part of the earth, and there's a lot of narratives and stories and histories about um, about it. And I really wanted to do my best to try to make sense of what it meant for people to have such different realities and different stories that they had about this place. And to see if I couldn't come to terms with them in some ways to make sense of it for myself. As someone who's really interested in creating a more peaceful world, a more just and fair world, um, I sometimes look at conflicts and I wonder how they started or why they continue, what fuels them, what, um, what, uh, what incites them and what their damages are. And, and, and so looking at this particular place, where it seems like if there's ever been an argument for the sort of, what do you call it, the grimness of human nature, you might say it's there. Um, and yet at the same time, when you go there, as when you go anywhere else, you discover that people everywhere are human beings and have stories to tell and show love to each other in so many different ways. Um, so that place is, I think, an extreme version of 
where, how we are everywhere, I guess is what I want to say. So I'm going to read a series of poems, some of which are set in that place. So you're going to be traveling with me there. And some of them are set in my neighborhood, which is outside of Cleveland. It's called University Heights. This neighborhood is predominantly an Orthodox Jewish neighborhood. And I am not Orthodox Jewish. So I am a sort of a minority in this little community. I happen to be Arab American. So um, that's interesting, I think. Um, and so I've been thinking a lot about what that means. And, and in some ways, my neighborhood became a, um, a kind of place where I could think about neighborliness and the ways in which this conflict forces us to ask the question, what does it actually mean to love one's neighbor? What does it actually mean to try to love one's neighbor as oneself, actually, which is the, the full version of um, one of the ethical principles, um, which is an interesting one if you think about it. So I'm gonna read some poems from that. And uh, so here you come into my neighborhood. You're actually coming into my backyard for this first poem. Uh, this is a sequence of three poems. One tree, two neighbors, and three books. Here's the first part. One tree. They wanted to tear down the tulip tree, our neighbors, last year. It throws a shadow over their vegetable patch the only tree in our backyard. We said no. Now they've hired someone to chainsaw and arm the crux on our side of the fence. And my wife, in tousled hair and morning sweats, marches to stop the carnage mid-limb. It reminds her of her childhood home, a shady place to hide. She recites her litany of no returns. Minutes later, the neighbors emerge. The worker points to our unblinded window. I want to say, it's not me. Slide out of view behind a wall of cupboards, on an ominous breakfast table, steam of tea, our two young daughters now alone. I want no trouble. Must I fight for my wife's desire for yellow blooms when my neighbor's tomatoes will stunt and blight in shade? Always the same story. Two people, one tree, not enough land or light or love. Like the baby brought to Solomon, someone must give. Dear neighbor, it's not me. Bloom shadowed, light deprived, they lower the chainsaw again. Two neighbors. In Cleveland, snow so thick, it looked as if it were not falling but hovering. I shuffled along the snowbanked side of Washington Boulevard, halfway to campus, when a suburban rolled past, slowed. The driver's window lowered to a woman in copper wig. In a Brooklyn accent, she asked if I needed a ride. I didn't know her from Eve. She was brave or kind or both. I'm almost there, I replied. She said, you'll probably get there before I do. We laughed together in the falling snow as she rolled up her window. Into the minibus near Jerusalem, the young Palestinian climbed. He wore a pen in his Oxford, black hair parted clean. We got to talking where we were from. He hoped, he said, to study engineering in Cleveland. The minivan braked. We pulled out passports. A soldier barked something we couldn't follow. A young man said something we couldn't follow, his hands dancing empty in the air. The soldier grabbed his wrists. We pulled away, we couldn't follow. And he, surrounded by three soldiers, grew smaller as we drove farther, closer to Jerusalem, until we turned and disappeared from each other. And this is three books. Ready? Three books. One, two, three. Go. We lived in those leaves. Was a book May so large? We lived in those leaves. You couldn't be holding it. Before we were told. You'd have to march for miles just to read a line. Scissors from branch. 
And the ink was so richly branch. black, according it felt like Shorn falling to just to look. According to Shorn from the spine. In each stanza was not a room, every day. but a there state. Is Again, every day. In each poem, for the a country of its own. Some days we could not tell what was the poem and what was the world. Again, when we every found day. a breeze, we Again, wondered whether day. it was someone Probing turning a leaf or a season's new weather. We can spend our binding. life like this, We're most seeking of the binding. The page, Again, every day. Each Trying. new line Again, can every never day. be the Trying. same. The yet yes. unsubscribed. The sky was where the sky. To be the where land was the land. The, the leaves that we had to find the, the past. Where the book ends. Writing by future. And where we are by future. Praying to be written. Thanks, guys. Good job. Give him a hand. So that was Kaylin and Fitz, right? Awesome. Thank you so much. So that's, that's the first sequence of the book. One tree, two neighbors, three books. All right. I gave this a go earlier today. We'll, we'll try it again. This poem is called Family. This is about a certain episode which occurred at my university campus. Have you ever been to one of those events where there's a controversy or a sort of a protest, a spillage of some kind? Well, this is what happened. It's called Family. At the Catholic University, a speaker clicks through slide after slide of barbed wire, cattle chute checkpoints, and walls. His mantra, occupation. What threatens the Christians, he concludes, is what threatens Palestinians. A woman stands up. I wanted to let everyone know, she says, that this talk was full of spin. I can't see her. She's behind me. I'm afraid to look back. The truth is the opposite. My heart goes out to her, standing in the heart of another country. The reason for the wall was that people were being attacked, she says, by terrorists. After all, the Arabs sold the land. It was too much trouble. I shrink back in my seat, shake my head. And at a Catholic school, you should know what the church has done, especially during World War II. Then a man gets up. I can't see him. He's behind me. I'm afraid to look back. The Jews bought a tiny bit of land, but the rest, the rest was stolen. My heart goes out to him, standing in the heart of another country. But, he says, they did not buy everything, even if they could buy Congress. I shrink again. She says, you have 14 Arab countries. Can't we have just one? They should take you in, he says. But this is our land. Why should we have to leave? Because Europe took it from us? That is why we fight. What about peace, someone mumbles. He says, how can you negotiate over a pizza when one side continues to eat? She says, how can you negotiate over a pizza when one side is trying to stab you with knives? It goes on like this for a long time. Years, decades, generations. I sit like a child at the table, watching parents grip their utensils, spit words like shrapnel. I hate how I love them. Ashamed, I stare down, wanting to bury the hot metal. Okay. How are we doing? Are you feeling it so far? Are you getting into this poetry thing? One of the things that I discovered in the process of studying the conflict was also that there are many courageous people on both sides working for justice and peace. And those voices, I wanted to be part of this book. So I'm going to read a couple pieces of courageous um, activists, testifiers. People are living out their, their vision of what a world would look like beyond violence, beyond war. Um, over and over, I'm just shocked by how brave some people can be. And um, here's one. This is called Demolition Diptych. So it's two parts for a guy named Ezra Nawi. Ezra Nawi is an Israeli who's also Arab. Um, he's a Jewish Arab or an Arab Jew. I don't know if the right term is exactly, but he comes from the Sephardic tradition, which means that his family came from 
I think it was from Iraq, but basically he speaks Arabic, he culturally feels Arabic, but he's also Jewish by faith and by family. And um, his activism has been to stand in solidarity with Palestinian families whose houses are being destroyed because they're built in an area called Area C, which is um, during the peace accords was supposed to be given, basically Israel had control of it, over it, yet there, there were Palestinians living there. So this is for Ezra Nawi. First part is sort of from the point of view of a soldier um, tearing down a house, and the second part is about Ezra sort of like, like trying to stop it from happening. One, look how they live. How easy to kick in the corrugate and enter rifle first, adjust the helmet in the unlit interior, this sweat-heavy stable no resistance, just these bleeding sheep that speak. And we steer the troublemaking cameraman and, and these people with rifles out. The door we made in the wall. No one was shot. Everyone's breathing. The laughing dozer completes the deed. Adrenaline flares. It's burning currents through our neural circuits and muscles still twitching in delight. As after a night of drink and blackout against dusty truck, we lean and suck the starry nicotine into flared lungs. And tonight we return to our own beds, alive, alive, unable to sleep, unable to dream. We will see everything fold again like a house. Two, for Ezra would dive beneath the half-demolished shell of a house as if to stave off what has already happened, ghost of where and what he is, Jew and Arab, standing among Arabs who can't understand why their house must fall and why the bulldozer's teeth, teeth must sink into its chest, a lung collapsing. On the video you hear Ezra's adrenaline gasping with in trembling hands, the soldier binds in plastic cuffs tighter and then tighter again. Why are you tightening them? The soldiers laugh. Is it funny the kids will sleep outside? And the only thing here left is hatred. And I did what my heart told me to do. And I will lodge an immediate appeal for Ezra in Hebrew means help. For those who are interested, there's a movie called Five Broken Cameras about one of these Palestinians who was um, engaging in nonviolent activism to stop a wall from being built between his village and the, um, and the olive trees that were the way that the villagers make their, make their, uh, make their livelihoods. There's a wonderful phrase in Arabic, a wonderful saying, the olive is the foundation of the house. Just simply to say that we depend on this thing. It sort of helps us stay alive. So a guy named Imad Bernat uh, got a, a camera to sort of videotape the, or you know record the demonstrations that were happening. And you know when you use when you record demonstrations, that sometimes deters violence from happening. And uh, yet over the course of these demonstrations. He had five that were broken. In any case, uh, this is a poem for Imad Bernat called Marginalia. And just to show you, the poem is actually written like in the margins. Um, so, Marginalia with uprooted olive. One of the things that happens in these conflicts is things like trees get pulled up because um, as punishment to, to people who are resisting. And these trees are, you know, their livelihoods. So, uh, the, the poem is concerned with this, this practice. The margin is not the margin to the margin. Above the drone trails a sound like a mower cutting the sky. You look up precedence for seizure, stand with fellahin and land in prison. In the margin, to turn outside is to riddle the inside. You stake your right stalk and scrawl across the white lawn of law. They write you gone, old weed. You will not leave your stony margin. Your roots, like limbs, claim horizon. Back a few years ago, 
I was um, canvassing for electoral reasons for a presidential election, and I knew that many of my neighbors, uh, by, by sort of their natural constituencies um, and, and alliances, would have been uh, voting for this, I guess this would have been 2004, would have been you know, voting for Bush because of his staunch support of Israel. And um, knowing that, but not really being a fan of uh, President Bush, I would often talk to my neighbors about how John Kerry would also support Israel. And it, it sort of was hard for me because I also feel like Palestinians um, should be advocated for, but I, I was just trying to speak to my neighbors in a language that they would understand. Um, when I was in uh, Israel and Palestine, I bought a shirt that had both languages. It says Shalom and Salam in English and in Arabic and Hebrew, and uh, had both flags, the Israeli flag and the Palestinian flag. And I would run in my neighborhood to the astonishment of some of my neighbors who would look at my shirt in outright confusion. Well, they understood one half of the shirt, but not the other half. Um, and it appears to me that we're in a similar predicament in, this own, in our own country, right? We can understand one half, but not the other half. Um, in the sudden chill, dogwood leaves blush. I no longer jog shirtless along sidewalks of the orthodox, stitch kippas and flowing wigs hugging the skull, shielding the immodesty of hair. The sound of hammering in the air to nail temporary wooden homes outside less temporary homes, to remember how the ancestors wandered, their heads filled with words read from right to left, and left to right the ways the people had fallen from the unnameable. Years ago, I canvassed for Kerry, talking at screen doors and shaking heads, promising dogged support for Israel, knowing it could mean a wall between Ummi and olive trees she worries over like children. We saw each other on each side of a screen. I told the story to five shaking heads, then two bright nods to vote. I carried the light of those promises back home. I love the Sabbath, how my neighbors sojourn from home to God and God to home, carrying their story on scrolls on shoulders, shield in plastic, she sheathed in plastic during rain. Today I jog past the sukkahs wearing a, a shalom and salam t-shirt, a flag above each lung, two languages, peace and hello. I pass confused faces translating my chest, a language my neighbors know and do not know. Um, okay. So I could go on, but I'm not going to go too long. I would like to read two completely new poems and then, um, and then see where we go from there. Does that sound good? How are people feeling? Are you understanding stuff so far? You good? All right. You with me? All right. This is the part where I'm, I'm checking my email. Just kidding. <laughs> All right, this, this poem actually invites a little audience participation. Um, I read a beautiful, wonderful poem um, by an Iraqi poet called Toasts, and they were all these toasts he was giving to the various things that he wanted in, in the world and in his life. And I love the poem so much, and I saw him read it actually live. He was in exile from Iraq for like 40 years, and the joy with which he read this poem and the joy with which it was received in both Arabic and English just completely blew me away. So I'm going to ask your participation. And this is, you're just going to say a toast after I say toast. So we're all going to toast together. So raise your imaginary glasses. I don't know what you like, but imagine you have your favorite drink in your hand. And it could be anything. It could be diet soda as far as I'm concerned. But whatever it is, um, you ready? All right. Toast. A toast. toast. To the thirst that won't be quenched by drinking. A toast. To the hunger that dilates the mind. A toast. A toast. To the fire that guts the past and clears way for future. A toast. A toast. To the drought that dries up that dries up in the rain. A toast. A toast. To the one who's finally just stopped drinking and drinks to loneliness again. A toast. A toast. A toast. To the meal, the epilogue, to the long novel of toasting. A toast. A toast. 
to the people who don't know they're crazy. A toast, a toast. to the country that misplaces its border guards. A toast, a toast. to the borderland between our lives and the dream of our lives. A toast. a toast, to the one who won the election for a country that no longer exists. A toast, a toast. to the president who dreams he's lost his arms and wakes with an itchy scalp. A toast, a toast. to the walls that grow doors overnight. A toast. To the migrants, the authors of movement who write with their feet. A toast, a toast. to the weapon that misfires, burning the shooter. A toast. a toast, to the youth who don't know history, tells them it's not possible. A toast. a toast, to the elderly who live their last years where they've always lived, in another country. A toast, a toast. to social media and its endless feeds where the phone eats first. A toast to the internet that helps us forget what we never knew we needed to know. A toast, a toast. to the freedom where no one is free. A toast, a toast. unless everyone is free. A toast. a toast, to the peace that comes only when drinking. A toast, a toast. to the peace that comes when the drinking's done. A toast. a toast, to trading the buzz of today for the hangover of tomorrow. A toast, a toast. to the last page of the internet which reads, go the fuck outside. A toast. a toast to the host and the guest, to the ghost and this house where we die together tonight and rise in some distant yesterday, our bodies hiding in the light of a forgotten open page. Thank you. Thanks for participating. That was great. Yeah. Now we're all drunk <laughs> in the best way, in the best way. Um, this is another new poem, it's called Letter to the Citizens. Letter to the Citizens. The tank is on the tree lawn, the missile in the mail. Don't be afraid, you can go on with clipping your toenails, watering the garden, Netflix at night when you're tired of Twitter. Clean up the dishes, stack them in the cupboard. Don't worry what's behind the wall. Keep on scrolling your feed. Search for the thing you know is still a click away. You'll see. The drone is in the ceiling. The eyes are everywhere. The lies are all too willing to tantalize us bare. The gas is in the lettuce. The oceans slowly rise. Somewhere far, plastic grows like rice, waiting for no harvest. A bomb in the shape of a baby. Its head smells sweet as cream. Don't be afraid, it's soft, ready to be held in your arms, and will gaze up into your face from some other world where pain is yet to find the words and hunger is never erased. Okay. Um, so I have two more poems for you, and then hopefully we can have a little discussion, a little conversation. This is a, a prayer poem. It's called Devotional, and it's a prayer for light. And I, it's actually based on a Muslim prayer that I found. Um, this poem was from one of the surahs, which is uh, one of the parts of the Quran. And I, I'm a, a, a Catholic by, by, by birth, and I suppose now by, by practice, um, as strange as it is to, to to, to confess that publicly, um, given how crazy the church has been. <laughs> um, yet, uh, I find that every religious, every faith tradition has, um, has a sense about the light in each of us. In, uh, in the, you know, when I do yoga, the last thing we say is, you know, uh, namaste, and, and sometimes that's articulated as, you know, um, the light in me bows to the light in you. But uh, in the Jewish tradition, there's a great story in the Kabbalah, which is um, that in the beginning of time, there was this great um, source of light. And there were in these vessels, there were these vessels of light, but they broke and they got scattered across the universe. And it was the job of the faithful to come gather them where they may be found in each of us. So this is devotional. Light my face, 
and light the flesh of my flesh. Light each my eyes and light inside my sight. Light the light that makes me light in the bones and in my hands light and in my loins light. And light your light before and behind me, above and beneath me. Light to my enemies who in the moral dark will use my light against me. Light the dull swords of my ribs, the thick fist within. Light the blood-hot rooms pulsing there. Light the gates when they swing wide to the stranger. Light, more light on my tongue. In the light, light, more light. In the black, light. And when it's time to snuff this wick, light that light. All right, and this last poem is... Um, a, uh, a, a translation of a Russian poet named Lev Rubinstein, or Lev Rubinstein, and uh, he was a, a librarian in Lenin Library, and he would uh, often write his poems on library cards, and if you've ever seen an index card, um, this is the way that librarians used to keep track of everything. Um, all of those indices are sort of gone, I think, now, more or less. Has anybody seen these before? A library card? Students are like, what? <laughs> you had to actually look in these big, beautiful rows to find alphabetically the titles of works. Yeah, for sure, for sure. So this is a, a piece by Lev Rubinstein, would have been written on cards, a series of cards. It's called Unnamed Events. And this, this, this poem actually has some musical accompaniment. Let's see if I can make this work. And thank you so much for listening. Thanks. Um, do you guys know uh, this? Uh, anybody listen to Explosions in the Sky? Friday Night Lights? You all got to watch that show. All right. Well, any questions? That would have been written in the. Um, 1980s, yeah. So prior actually to the fall of the Soviet Union, but um, he was inspired by and influenced by um, a number of artists, um, part of what we would call the international avant-garde. So people who would have been trying to redefine what art can do and the, the role that it can play in our lives. Um, he was part of a, a group in the 1970s who would literally go out into the woods and sort of, um, they would make, do these things called 
at the time they were called happenings. They would do all sorts of um, playful activities in the woods. Um, for example, um, one time they were called to a certain place and they got, they got together and they were walking around in the woods and they were wondering, okay, so what's gonna happen next? Someone was supposed to be organizing it and they had all these conversations as they were walking in the woods and it turned out that they're searching for the activity was the activity and there was someone behind them recording all their conversations. And so those conversations became the work of art that was that happening. That's a wonderful question. So just if you didn't hear it in the back, uh, the question regards, I began with this idea of cultivating a sort of childlike wonder in writing. And how do I keep that or what do I do with that in the face of these conflicts and these very big problems in our world? And I would, uh, one of the things I just love about writing is that I try to write about things that I don't, haven't already decided what I know about them. Um, and that's how I can approach everything with a sense of wonder and, and the mystery of things, rather than, oh, I've decided that this person is this way and that way, and therefore I can sort of put them in a little box and push them aside. Um, so whether it's my neighbor, you know, um, who, uh, who I meet on the street who doesn't say hello to me, instead of just saying, well, that person's just a jerk, I start wondering, like, what sort of worldview would induce a person to pretend that someone who's outside of his tradition doesn't exist? And I thought, wow, that person must either be terribly afraid of, of the non-Jewish world, um, or they've experienced great trauma, or they see me as a potential threat and enemy. And then I just started thinking like, where does that come from? Well, hundreds and hundreds of years of Jews being persecuted. You know, like it's a real thing. So instead of taking it personally, I just started thinking about like, what's going on with this person to act in this way and just sort of try to imagine what it would be like to be that person, to be afraid of a world outside of the world that, that they've constructed. So um, it makes it a little bit easier to deal with the daily indignities of being human is to try to just like reframe them and think about other ways of looking at them. So does that help? Yeah, and you have to find beauty, you find, have to find the humor, you have to find the, the funny things, you know, like suddenly in our neighborhood all these kids are on these like, I don't even know what they're called, those things where if you tilt your feet this way, they kind of scoot along, what are those things called? Hoverboards. Is that what they are, hoverboards? So suddenly all these orthodox kids are using hoverboards, it's the funniest thing, I mean, like, I mean is, that, is that kosher? I, don't, I mean, I don't know, like, can you do that on the Sabbath? I'm not sure, you know, probably not, but, you know, so it's interesting, like, everything is curious, you know, um, for sure. Yes, I mean, everyone wants to know what, does lower the chainsaw mean it was cut, or does lower the chainsaw mean it wasn't cut? What do you think happened? Yeah. Should I, should I tell you? No, I mean, like, the poem is about, the poem is about this strange predicament. It's really about, you know, always the same story, you know, two people, one tree, not enough land or light or love. That's, that's what the poem is about. In actual fact, they, they did, they stopped cutting the, the tree. Um, but they were pissed off about it. <laughs> and I don't blame them, you know? I, I created this text as a, as a site for dialogue, as a site for people who disagree about this conflict to say, what, what are we gonna do now? Yeah, I, I really did. I mean, so yes, I believe that. I actually, my, my book of scholarship for my PhD, my, my dissertation that became a book is called Behind the Lines. It's about poets and their relationship to the American peace movement. 
And um, what one of the things I discovered was that um, poets had an uneasy relationship to that social movement, the anti-war movement, the peace movement. Um, they very much saw themselves as part of it, but also in dialogue with it, and that meant that they sometimes challenged some of the pieties and narratives of that movement, and sometimes were trying to find ways of expressing, articulating that experience that, in ways that, that weren't being articulated. Um, there's a, a kind of strange, um, uh, prickliness of, of artists relative to social movements insofar as social movements always try to, um, to sort of weaponize isn't the wrong word, but who try to mobilize through a kind of oversimplification of language. And I think artists are always interested in some degree of complexity. Um, and so there's sometimes a little bit of a tension between those between the kind of the articulation of freedom of the artist relative to a movement. For sure, I mean, yes, the artists constantly waken us to the fact that we aren't living in a binary world. It's not just good and evil, black and white, rich, poor, Protestant, Catholic, whatever, right? It's that we know that, um, and artists constantly awaken us to the, you know, the, the many colors of who we are, the many faiths of who we are, the many languages of who we are, the many attitudes of who we are. Um, yeah, you said gray, let's say rainbow, do you know what I mean? Let's say the, the you know, the technicolor, the prismatic, the, the, um, the wildly diverse, the, um, the beautiful, pageant of life such as it is. Yeah. Yeah, we get into, tr you know, like as much as everyone needs a story, a narrative, we get into trouble when we lock into a narrative and we stop understanding that narratives are fictions that we create to understand ourselves in the world. And every narrative, so everyone watching Fox News has a narrative. It doesn't matter how many fac facts you have, that's a narrative. Everyone watching CNN has a narrative. It doesn't matter how many things you throw at them, the narrative is, is, is there. So it doesn't matter what side you're on. Um, what matters is that we need to stop thinking in these sort of rigidly binary ways. And hopefully poetry just like reinfuses our minds and our hearts with, with that sense of our, our true, I don't know, beauty, strangeness, um, diversity, um, and uh, common, commonality, that we are actually more alike than unlike. Is that good? So I just want to say, like, thank you again so much for listening. I hope you got something out of this. I hope there's a fire in your heart that you're ready to share with others. And if you're interested, I have some books for sale out there. And um, if you can't afford one, I may be able to get you one for free if you're really into that sort of thing. So thanks again.